Thank you. So if you brought a Bible with you this morning, we are going to finish Mark chapter 9 here this morning as we pick up at verse 30 and we will try to make our way to verse 50. So I'll start right reading here in Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. It says, From there they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask. So at this point, Jesus is in the region of Galilee. He's going to be passing down through uh, Capernaum. Uh, Then he will cross over the Jordan from the east, go through the region of Jericho on his way to Jerusalem, where ultimately he would then go to the cross and die for the sins of the world and then be raised on the third day. Jesus had just taken his disciples prior to this up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember, he took Peter, James, and John. And he took them up to the Mount of Transfiguration and he was shining like the sun uh, in all of his glory. Uh, In a sense, Jesus peeled back his flesh and uh, gave these men a look at who he really was, seeing him in all of his glory. And guys, I truly believe that when you and I see Jesus for who he really is in all of his glory, uh, this is what will change our lives, Uh, seeing him for who he is. And this, in fact, did change these men's lives. Peter, as I said last, well, two Sundays ago, that Peter remembered this day very clearly. He recorded it when he wrote the epistle of Second Peter. And he recalled this very event and hearing the voice of God from heaven shout down and say, this is my son, speaking of Jesus, as he was transfigured there before him. And so an amazing thing happened here. Then they came down and they ran into the man there who had the child that was possessed by a demon and continued to throw himself into the fire. And Jesus cast this demon out. And remember, Jesus was saying that all things are possible with God. And so the disciples, having seen all of this, having spent some time with Jesus now, Now they're traveling along, and Jesus begins to talk about this idea and this concept of the Son of Man, speaking of Him, who was to be delivered, or the word could be there, um, given over, or betrayed, which is exactly what Judas did. He would be delivered or betrayed into the hands of men, they will kill Him. But then he will be raised three days later. And so to me, guys, this is the fourth time just in the Gospel of Mark that we have recorded that Jesus would take time to tell his disciples about the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Anytime the Bible states something once, it needs to be taken seriously. When it is said twice, it needs to be taken very seriously. When it is said three, four, five, six times, guys, it's something that we need to truly understand and grasp because God is continuing to tell us that this is very important. And so they're walking, they're seeing these miracles, and Jesus continually brings them back to this event that is going to happen. The disciples did not understand what Jesus was talking about. That's what verse 32 says. It says they did not understand, and they were actually afraid to ask him. You see, this brings me encouragement because these are Jesus' apostles. These are the ones who were going to go out and begin to spread the gospel throughout all the world. And here we see the apostles not understanding doctrine. This is what we would call doctrine. They're not understanding doctrine. And True, you can say, well, they didn't have the Holy Spirit abiding within them like we do. They don't have the tutor. The Spirit would come upon them until Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost. But truly, you look at the early church when the Holy Spirit did come upon them and they were born again. 
you see that even the early church struggled with these issues of doctrine. And so here is something that can be said about doctrine, that Christianity has never been doctrinally perfect. That's why I prayed about the different denominations. There's different flavors of different churches, different denominations, because there's different people. We can all be a little right and probably a little wrong. As long as we're not wrong on the essentials, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But think about this. Most of the New Testament, you think of most of the New Testament as Paul writing letters to the churches doing what? Trying to iron out doctrine. You think about the church there in Corinth that was a very immature, Paul would say, a very carnal church. And what was this immature, carnal church doing? Well, they were bickering about who was better, who they were following. Remember, they were saying, well, I'm of Paul, well, I'm of Apollos, well, I'm of Cephas. And Paul said, don't you guys understand that we are all just servants of Christ? And so even this church in Corinth had issues over doctrine. So Christianity has never been doctrinally perfect. Most of the New Testament was Paul correcting these wrong ideas, these various wrong ideas. Think about it. In Corinth, there was actually a report that this church was tolerating incest. There was also the people in the church who were suing one another, taking each other to court. You had these discussions over, should we eat at uh, pagan temples where they're sacrificing their meat to idols? Should we eat this or should we not eat this? These are doctrinal issues, guys. There were some who thought they were more, more holy than the others because they um, remained celibate. In Corinthians, Paul irons that out. They thought they were more holy than those who were married because they were celibate. So these were issues that were going on in the church. Some thought that they should divorce their wife. If they were in a relationship where they were unequally yoked and all of a sudden God is really convicting you to get your life right and surrender to Him and you do that, some were saying, well, if you have, have yourself married to a non-believer, then you are to get divorced. And Paul irons out these issues. But these are doctrinal issues. And isn't it sound interesting because we still kind of struggle with some of these doctrinal issues. Paul also talked about um, Christians, being Christians despite our mistakes. And why can we still be Christians even though our doctrine is not perfect? Because of the foundation. The foundation is what? It's what Jesus just said right here. He repeats it four times. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel, that Jesus died for our sins, that we are sinners in need of saving. And Jesus' death on the cross is the payment for our sins. He was buried, and then He was resurrected from the dead. And this is how men are saved. In fact, you can read about this. We're going to turn here in a minute to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because here's what Paul says. What did Paul preach? Sure, he tried to iron out a lot of doctrine. That's what a lot of his letters were. But look what Paul says. Take it from his own mouth. Chapter 15, verse 1. Paul says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold La if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Interesting that he says it's the gospel that we receive, that then we stand upon, that we are also saved, that we are holding fast to. It's the gospel. It's this fundamental truth of what Jesus did there on the cross. Look at verse 3. He says, For I delivered to you as of First importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. What did Paul say? He took first precedence, that when he came preaching, what was the first thing he began to preach? Did he iron out all the doctrinal issues? First? No, he did not. He said first, he delivered to them the first and most important 
concept. And this was Jesus dying for our sins and the burial and the resurrection. The same thing that Jesus was telling his disciples here. Because what we're going to see through these next couple verses is a problem with these apostles and disciples that is the same with you and I. Because they're human, just like we are. And this idea of gaining things based on our own merits. It's kind of what our society even consists of. That I have because I've worked hard for it. That if you work hard, you will receive it. This whole merit thing. I won first place because I'm the best. That's just what society is. It's ingrained into us. And so what's fascinating is remembering this fundamental truth about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus that supersedes all of the other stuff. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. As you're going to see the disciples arguing with one another, back in Mark in a minute, about who the greatest is in the kingdom of God. Who is going to be the best? Who is going to be number one? Who is going to be Jesus' right-hand man in the kingdom of God? See, I think the disciples knew that something was cooking. They knew, they didn't know exactly what this death, burial, and resurrection meant, but they knew that Jesus was doing things, they believed He was the Messiah, but they thought He was going to come, set up the kingdom, and they were going to be right there, His entourage, and so they were kind of jockeying for position. I want to be recognized, when Jesus comes in His glory, I want people to see Jesus and me right there next to Him. Right? This merits. I've done more than you, John, so I'm probably going to have a better place next to Jesus. That's how we think. Everything's merit-based. And sadly, guys, it has nothing to do with merits. It has everything to do with grace. Grace is undeserved. Grace is something you cannot work for. Grace is just a free gift. It's something that is given to you. It doesn't require anything in return. It's given. And listen to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. At verse 31, after Paul explains all of these marvelous gifts even in the church. That very interestingly, if you read through all those gifts, at the end, it says that the Spirit, in verse 11 of chapter 12, it says, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So God says, hey, you're going to have all these gifts. You're going to be able to um, prophesy. You're going to be able to have all these great doctrinal uh, words of faith and all of these things, and you're going to be exercising these gifts to edify the body of Christ. But yet it's the Holy Spirit who distributes these gifts as He wills, not as you and I fight for them or think that because I'm a good speaker I should be this or or that. It's not merit-based. It's based on what the Holy Spirit wills according to God's will because it's His church. They're His gifts. They're His to give. And so what I'm getting to is this. After all of this, and I get excited when I hear about gifts and prophecy and all this stuff, and I think, man, you know, that's awesome. But then Paul says something here in 1 Corinthians 12 at verse 31. He says, but all of these great gifts, he says, earnestly desire the greater gifts. He says, and then I will show you still a more excellent way. All of these greatest gifts that he talks about, and yet he says, I will still show you even a more excellent way. What is it? Well, we all know this chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. That it says in verse 1, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Skip down to verse 8 says, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know now in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, who's that? Jesus. The partial will be done away with. 
When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, and love abide in these three. But the greatest is love. The greatest is love. And so, yes, doctrine is very important, but the foundation is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And love is the essence of who God is, guys. God is love. And so here, we're going to see these disciples who are arguing over who is going to be the greatest, and yet Jesus is going to tell them it's going to be the servant of all, right? The one who chooses to Make others' lives better. That's what a servant is. A servant is somebody who is helping somebody to become better or helping them to be better. It's making somebody else's life better. That's what a servant is. It's not being consumed with my life, with what I can get out of the deal. What's in it for me? I'll serve only if. That's not a servant. That's not definitely not the servant of all. It's caring for other people. It's helping other people. It's wanting to have other people be better. That's what a servant is. And so Jesus here in verse 33 says, They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So here the first thing I find fascinating is that they're on their way to Capernaum, probably uh, Peter's mother-in-law's house. Remember, Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters Uh, while he was here on the earth. And so they're walking along, and the disciples, I could just see them following Jesus probably, right? Jesus leading the way, they're following him. And I could just see them whispering to each other, talking in secret. And what were they talking about? Who was going to be the greatest? Who's number one? And so Jesus here knows what they were talking about. And he calls them on it. He says, what was that that you guys were talking about on the way? And I love that the disciples stayed quiet. You see, Peter was always one who loved to blurt out because he thought he was self-righteous at times. He thought he was better than the other apostles. Remember when Jesus said, you're all going to fall away. And Peter said, not me, Lord. Not me. All these other losers will probably fall away, but not me. I'm your number one guy. Right? But Jesus They kept quiet here, and to me, this is a good indication that maybe the disciples, some of what Jesus was teaching them was actually sinking in. It was actually sinking in because they had to know by staying quiet that what they were talking about was probably not Christ-like. They probably had that assumption. That's why they stayed quiet. That's what I believe. And so Jesus says to them, though, What was it that you guys were talking about? And here's something we need to remember, guys. Those conversations, let's let's expand this a little bit that Jesus knows everything. There are no little secret conversations. You think you're having a secret conversation. Let me tell you, God is in the middle of that secret conversation. So be aware when we're wanting to, to go into dark places and say things that we shouldn't be saying. Be aware that God is full aware of what is going on in that dark place. We need to always be aware of the presence of God. Boy, I tell you, when I'm remembering the presence of God and that the Holy Spirit lives within me, that tends to kind of direct my path onto a more straight and narrow path. But if I'm only thinking that Jesus is here at the church, and so when I come to church, I got to dress up and I got to look good and I got to praise Jesus, but then when I get out of the church, I'm going to raise all kinds of hell. That's not understanding that God is present no matter if you're in the church or you're out of the church or you're up on a hill or you're down in a hole. 
Jesus is full aware of these things. And he, turn with me to Psalm 139, a very good reminder about the presence of God and that God is fully aware. See, this is either going to uh, make me more in awe of God, which it always will because none of us are perfect, to know that God sees those deepest, darkest secrets within me that nobody else knows about. God sees them. And when I remember about these things, and I know these things, it makes me fall more on my face. The grace of God, who is still working these things out of me and you. But the fact that He knows everything, He knows it all. Look at Psalm 139, verse 1. I'm actually going to read all the way to 16. It says, O Lord, You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. I love that. We don't serve some far off distant God who's just sending down these harsh commandments. And if we don't obey, he'll strike us dead. This says that God is acquainted, intimately acquainted with his people with our ways. Verse 4 says, even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high and I, and I cannot attain to it. Where can I go? So God, the first six stanzas here, that God knows everything. There is no hiding anything from God. So the best thing to do is just agree with God. And say, God, hey, I'm struggling in this area. I'm struggling with these thoughts. Help me to take these thoughts captive. Help me to submit myself to you. Resist the devil and flee. God already knows what you're going through. God already knows what you're struggling. He is drawing you to him. Just like the apostles stayed quiet when Jesus pierced them with his words. Well, Jesus still pierces us with his words today too. And that shouldn't make us defensive. Well, I did that because of this, Jesus. And, you know, I have every right to do that, Jesus. It's better to stay quiet, humble ourselves before the Lord, and wait for Him to speak and to reveal and to purify. As we're going to see here at the end, guys, we're all going to go through the fire, the salting and the fire. The Christians, this fire is a refining process, burning off all that garbage all those things that are of no value to the kingdom of God. That's what our trials and tribulations are, guys. Drawing us closer to Him. And then there also will be those who will end up in the fire permanently. Those who reject the free gift of God through Jesus Christ. Those will be cast into a place called Gehenna that we're going to read about here. The lake of fire where they will live forever in a fixed state of torment and torture. The picture is, is they're going to be in fire, they're going to be on fire, but they're going to be alive still, not consumed. That sounds like torture to me. Ongoing for all of eternity. And so guys, God knows the things we're going, going through. He knows the things we're struggling with. It's better to just submit to Him and say, God, I confess this to you, forgive me of my sins, cleanse me, and give me a new heart. Give me a new direction. Give me a new desire. I want to follow you. And God will honor words like that, guys. God will honor that prayer. For you to desire Him more, that's what God wants. And so look at verse 7, because now He's going to remind us that not only does God know everything, but God is everywhere. Verse 7 says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. At your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. There you go. Scratch your head on that one. He's God. He's God. The darkness and the light are alike to Him. He's the Creator. 
He's all things. Verse 13, for you formed me. You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. Wow. Remember in Ephesians when Paul says that? That we should walk in the works that God has performed before time for us to walk in? That's what the psalmist is saying here, that God has ordained these things for us to do, that we would walk in them. When as yet there was not one of them. Before we were even formed in our mother's wombs, God had a plan and a purpose for us. God knows us. And I love that because sometimes, guys, I'm going to speak to those who have maybe sunk to a very dark place. And to me, that's comfort. To know that Even if you feel like you're drowning, we're going to talk about having a millstone around your neck and thrown into the sea. Picture that for a minute. I'm afraid of drowning. I'll say that right now. If God, if that's the way I go, man, drowning, they say it's the most peaceful way to go, but, you know, nobody ever uh, came back and said drowning is the best way to go. (laughs) They say you just go to sleep, but I'll tell you, before you go to sleep, can you imagine the sheer... I mean, being chained to the bottom of the ocean and seeing the top and trying to swim up, but you're chained. I have to say that at times I've felt like that. Drowning. And where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Why? Because in the darkest place, you cannot flee from the presence of God. You go to the darkest place, behold, He is there. What did that say? The darkness and the light are the same to God. He's everywhere. If you go to the outermost stars, behold, I am there. You can't flee from the presence of God. And what that does for me is it keeps me reverent before God, keeps me walking the straight and narrow, but it also gives me great comfort. Great comfort that no matter how hot, no matter how hard, no matter how dark, God is present. God is present. And He's living within us if we have received Him as our Lord and Savior. And so what a beautiful thing here. Guys, God is full aware. God is in control. And this is where I want to go quickly to the book of Matthew. Because at a time like this, I've already heard and seen a lot of people getting nervous or seeing what's going on. And, and, you know, we aren't to fear these things, but... I want to look at this for a minute because, again, it paints to the picture that God is aware of everything that's going on. In fact, God has prophesied that exactly what is happening is going to happen, and then He shows us a little insight into things to come. And so let's look at this here for a minute. In Matthew chapter 24, picking up at verse 3, it says, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, tell us when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now the disciples asked him these three things, probably thinking that all three of these things were going to happen right now. But truly, this is what Jesus does, is he begins to lay out a timeline for us. That all these events weren't going to happen as the disciples thought right here and now. He said, let me tell you about the things that will happen. He says, the signs of his coming and the end of the age. So skip down, verse 4. says, and Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And many will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the birth pangs. And so 
The point that Jesus is referencing here, the time period, is from his ascension into heaven. The book of Acts records that and the end of the Gospels record that when Jesus gave his disciples the farewell and then he ascended into heaven. So the time period Jesus is speaking of is the time that he ascended to the time that he returns, not the rapture, the time that he returns, his second coming, the great and awesome day of the Lord. So keep that in mind. So what are the first couple things we read here in verses 4 and 5? Well, that there will be many false Christs that come to mislead you. It's not too hard to look around and see how watered down the church is becoming. How there are many leaders. You think of even the most recent, the prosperity gospel, which is very frightening. The name it and claim it. And so there will be many to mislead. I just recently heard a statement by somebody who is a very um, powerful, in the world sense, um, man. And it just kind of made me startle to hear this. And you see this a lot with the United States right now. This man was so bold to say that God is on our side. And guys, I think you need to be very careful when you start making statements that God is on your side. Because I'm reminded of what Peter says in Acts chapter 10. That God is not partial. That God is not a respecter of men. You see, you want to try to have some merits in your life as a Christian and these good works that you're doing that are justifying that God is on your side and not on somebody else's side. I will throw this out to you. I think the better response is not God is on our side, but that we need to be on God's side. God, you want to try to bring God into your side of the fight, I will say you're already wrong. Because you're either on God's side or you're not. That's it. That's why I said in Ezekiel chapter 38, it fascinates me that there's no one there to come to the help of Israel. No one except God. And so be careful when people want to start calling God on our side. God is not a respecter of persons, guys. There's nothing that is going to make us more holy than somebody else. We need to be on God's side. And so be careful because many false Christs will come about. And what are they trying to do? Well, they're misleading people. The second thing we hear about is wars and rumors of wars. But yet the end still has not come. We've been hearing about wars and wars to come for a long time. And Jesus says right here, remember when this was written, guys. It wasn't written like 100 years ago or 200 years ago. This was written a long time ago. And he's saying that there will be continued wars and rumors of wars. Guess what's happening? Wars and rumors of wars. Since the ascension of Jesus, before that, of course, you had the Jews and there was always war, but it's going on in this time period that Jesus says it will be going on, and we find ourselves in this condition. You see, the peaceful existence, you know, I desire peace. The Bible says we should desire peace. We shouldn't be antagonists and these sorts of things. But here's a fallacy, I believe. Those who believe that eventually everything's going to work out. That this world is going to become this peaceful utopia. What is that sign on the bumper stickers? They still make them. I can't believe it. Coexist, right? A little of this, a little of that, a little of that. Well, just, you know, it's all going to be good. This peaceful existence, the Bible is saying here in Matthew chapter 24, guys, that from the period of Jesus' ascension to his return, things are going to go from bad to worse. So I hate to be a pessimist. I'm not being a pessimist. I'm reading the scripture. But I think that when somebody comes with these grandiose things about how it's all going to just work out and it's all going to just be wonderful. Well, when Jesus Christ returns and sets up his kingdom, yes. Yes. But until then... Guys, it's not going to happen. And many are trying to convince everyone that we can all just, in fact, I just read 
yesterday that there's this big thing going on in, in the Methodist church. They're actually splitting now because some of the Methodists uh, believe in uh, ordaining um, um, homosexuals as pastors and, and this and that, and uh, the other half of the church is in disagreement, so they're, they're splitting. Now, those are issues, guys, that, uh, you know, you need to be on God's side with those issues. What does the Bible say? Well, the Bible's pretty clear. Homosexuality is a sin like all the other sins listed there, but when we start sanctifying sin, we're trying to get God on our side. God agrees with this. Surely God's okay with this. No. No, God's not on our side. We need to be on His side. What is His side? There's a pretty good road map right here. This is God's side. If I agree with it or disagree with it, that's up to me. Right? It's not up to God. God says it, and I either believe it or I don't. And so, you know, scary things. But many will come to uh, mislead you know, her wars and rumors of wars. The third thing is that nation will rise against nation, famines, earthquakes. And the Bible says something very interesting there in verse 8, that these, this isn't the end, that these are just merely the birth pangs, the beginning of the birth pangs. The birth pangs, or uh, when a mother goes into labor, that's what it's speaking of. Those contractions will get uh, more frequent, Right? They'll get closer together and they will get more intense. They'll get stronger until that baby is ready to come out. And so Jesus is saying all of these things will always be, but what you will see is they will begin to get more frequent and they will begin to get more intense. And so we see that. We see that. Now there's nuclear threats. Well, there was nuclear threats a while back, but now even more so. Chemical warfare and all of these kinds of things. And you know, a society that is wanting to be peaceful isn't super concerned about building more and more weapons. Now, weapons keep us safe, don't get me wrong. But if it's just going to be this peaceful, happy, go lucky utopia, what do you need weapons for? <laughs> right? Because it's not peaceful. You need weapons to make it peaceful so that guys that come to threaten you, you're able to defend yourself. So it goes to the point of, uh, you know, are we getting more peaceful or are we getting less peaceful? Well, open up the newspaper. Uh, there is no peace. There is no peace. These things will increase, guys, more frequently. Now, from verse 9 to 14, you can reference this all with Daniel chapter 9, by the way, the 70 weeks of Daniel. You can reference it with Revelation 14. But this next section here is debated. That if this isn't right before the tribulation period or the beginning of the tribulation period, uh, when I begin to read this, I see uh, the newspaper today. Look at verse 9. It says, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. So these are obviously followers of Christ or disciples of Christ. He's speaking to his disciples, but he says here that they will deliver you over to be killed and you will be hated. Why? Because of Jesus' name. Look at verse 10, says, At that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Interesting, he's talking about disciples here. He's not talking about this threat that's coming from the outside. He's now talking about a threat coming from inside. Gee. Don't we see that happening even? It says, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Why? Because of lawlessness, it will be increased. And most people's love, look at that word, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. So let's break some of this down for a minute, starting at verse 9, which is the beginning of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And the first thing that we see is going to happen here in the period of time between the ascension of Jesus into heaven that's already happened and Jesus Christ's return, His second coming, which has not happened yet. In this period of time, we read that... Um, 
we will be delivered, or they, disciples, will be delivered over into tribulation, where they will be killed, they will be hated by all the nations because of my name. And so disciples, guys, should expect to be persecuted, right? To what extent? We don't know. But we know that there are Christians in other parts of the world that are living this out right now. There was just 10 more a week or two ago that was beheaded by ISIS. Christians. And it's not like Christians are, are, are building missiles and building silos and, and this and that. Why are the Christians being persecuted? Because there is a war. There is a spiritual war. There is a hatred for God. There is a hatred for the followers of God. And such a, a great, I mean, our God is a God of love and redemption. And yet so many people make God out to be something that He's not. And they're willing to kill for it. It's always been. The disciples, the first disciples were all murdered, martyred for their faith. And so we need to expect that there will be persecution. Uh, the one that I find fascinating here, when it says, verse 10, at that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Guys, this is speaking from within, I believe, within even the church. Listen to this. Persecution will reveal the traitors within the church as well as those from the outside. Right? That's what persecution does. That's why I say persecution or the fire for the Christian is refining, is sanctifying, is purifying us. Whereas the fire for the non-believer is going to scorch them. You see, this is what trials and tribulation do. And you're going to see this. What did it just say? Many will fall away because of the tribulation. Remember that amazing parable that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 13. The parable of the tares and the wheat. How the tares were growing up with the wheat. And they looked identical. You couldn't tell the wheat from the tares. And God said, first of all, we're told that the devil planted those tares among the wheat. And when the servant wanted to go and pull out those tares, what did the owner of the land say? He said, don't pull them out. Because if you do, you may uproot some of that good wheat. So wait and let them grow together until the harvest comes. And then we will take away those tares and they will be cast and thrown into the fire. Whereas the wheat then will be taken and put it into the storehouse. You see, guys, these difficult times, and I believe, sure, I think we have a reprieve with our current president. God's hand is upon him one way or the other. God is using him, and I believe he's spared us. I mean, all the things that he has done for Christians in general, this, taking out this guy, I'm telling you, this guy was a very, very evil man. But I will tell you that things will wax cold that things will get more difficult. And these persecutions and these trials, guys, they're either going to make us or they're going to break us. They're going to prove what we are. Because if all the fluffy, fancy, nice, feel-good stuff goes away, are you going to go away too? Am I going to go away? When it begins to affect our wallets, when it begins to affect how and where we meet, right? Right? Will these things affect us? You know, the church is going to be purified. Remember what the Bible says, judgment starts on the heathen? No, judgment starts in the house of God. Judgment will start in the house of God. And so these trials and these tribulations will prove who we are and what we are. And don't get me wrong, we all have room to grow. That's why I say we need to be closer to Jesus now than we ever have been. Moving into the new year. Abiding in Christ. And so what an amazing thing here. Many will fall away. Many will fall away, guys. Notice also it says false prophets will rise up. And with their success, mislead many. That's why I say with the name it and claim it thing, you know, wealth in the church has never been a good thing. Wealth in the nation of Israel has never been a good thing. Because what does it do? It takes us away from God. 
We aren't dependent on God anymore. God is in our provision. My job is. My bank account is. You see, many will rise up and think that God is really blessing them because of these great works that they have done, that now they are wealthy. That's dangerous. I think that's where the church becomes dogmatic. They become dog- we become dogmatic, and we get into these routines and these rituals, and what are we doing? We're waxing cold. The Spirit isn't moving. God isn't being worshipped in spirit and truth. He's being worshipped by uh, dumping stuff in a box, checking things off a list, serving with impure motives, looking for ambition. Who's the greatest in this church? Right, let's put a list on the wall. Who did so much? Okay, you're number one today. Okay, you're number two. Sadly, some churches do that. You can have a seat with your name on it if you give a certain amount of money. You'll have this place of honor right in the front row. So when you walk in, everybody can, woo, there's Gerald or Joe. Right? Guys, tribulations and trials are going to purify God's church are going to purify God's church. So uh, are we going to bicker and fight over God's on my side or are we going to say, God, (laughs) I'm on your side? Because what happens if you begin to see that God maybe isn't on your side? Are you going to then leave and find somewhere else where God's on their side? Guys, these are all real questions. These are all real things. These are things that eventually will come. I don't know how much of the church, I believe in pre-tribulation rapture. I don't know how much of the church will see this, but what I have to say is there are parts of the world that are already seeing this. There are parts of the world that are already seeing this. Notice also it says in this period of time, from Jesus' ascension to his return, the things will get worse. Society will become worse and worse. This is a, a gradual worsening of things. Lawlessness. All of this will lead to lawlessness and mischief that begins from inside the church and uh, this is the beginning of God judging His church. Mischief in the church, right? Lawlessness allowed to come into the church. We're living like heathens, but we're calling it God being on our side. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Remember what God warned, Jesus Himself warned, the church of Ephesus. And really, when you do a study of the letters to the churches, I think we are the church of Ephesus. At least in this sense. Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, when Jesus talks about having left your first love. Right? Having left your first love. I'll read it here. It's Revelation chapter 2. Verse 4, Jesus, writing to this church of Ephesus, says, But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Notice it doesn't say lost your first love. Right? You left. It's a choice. What did we just read about in Matthew? That many will fall away. That's a choice, guys. Nobody's dragging you away. They may drag you away and do some things to you you never thought they would do, but it's not speaking of your relationship with God. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. But he says, you have left your first love. Verse 5 says, therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deed you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Guys, that sounds pretty serious. That we have become hardened, that we have become calloused. And what do you see? This is what has been on my heart since before Christmas. Is just the, and I'm talking throughout mankind, not just in the church. Now you're seeing it more in the church. But this coldness, this hard-heartedness. And guys, the Bible even says there, Ephesus, Revelation says that Ephesus, this church was still doing all these great works. Jesus commended him for all these great things, but he says, this I have against you. You've left your first love. Not you've lost it, you've left it. And so you see this picture of things, hearts getting cold, hearts getting hard. Think about this. When the heart grows cold, everything done will be cold. Right? I mean, do we see that today? Do we see a lot more love or a lot more hate? 
I've heard things come out of Christians' mouths that I scratch my head. Hey, no, we're not perfect, but it, it's a picture into the window of the heart. That the heart is just cold. And guys, why is the heart cold? And once the heart becomes cold, the preaching becomes cold. The preaching becomes cold. The moving of the Spirit becomes cold. The praying becomes cold. What about giving to God? The giving to God will become cold. Here's something scary. That the cold heart will then not care for the poor in Christ. This mentality of hoarding it all for myself and living to grow to get rich. Right? That that's the pursuit. And this all kind of leads into where we're in with Mark, with Jesus' disciples concerned about being the greatest. And who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Guys, that's a picture of just, it's a wrong thinking. It's a wrong heart. And so these things will get worse. The fifth thing is that Jesus says here, the gospel will still be preached in the whole world. And then the end will come. And the next section, you can read that and research that. At some time, we'll get to it. But that's breaking down the um, abomination of desolation, the Antichrist who eventually will come and, and make peace for three and a half years, and everything will be good, and Israel will think it's their Messiah, the Antichrist. They'll build a temple. They will do all these things, which, by the way, they already have the heifers. They already have all the utensils for the temple. They just need the okay to build the temple. He'll allow them to build the temple until the middle of that three-and-a-half-year period when he all of a sudden comes in, declares himself to be God. He sits in the Holy of Holies. He demands to be worshipped. At that point, then Jesus says, flee. If you're around, flee. Get out of Jerusalem. Right? This is the end, guys. This is what God has told us. And I'll tell you, everything has, has God ever lied? Has God ever said something that didn't happen? Technically, yes. There are some things that haven't happened yet that God said. But everything that God has said in the past has come to pass. So why should we believe any different than what God says about the future will happen as well? Because God is true. And these things will happen. Remember what we just read in Psalm 139. God knows everything. He knows the times. And so this shouldn't make us slothful because really you have two different groups. And this is where we'll close. This kind of got off track. But you see, the answer isn't for us. As Jesus says, the first will be last and the last will be first, okay? Many people, I think, interpret this wrong. That somehow Jesus is saying we should just throw off ambition. It's wrong to have ambition. I will say this about ambition. The Bible does speak down upon selfish ambition. The ambition that is in it for you. That you want to get to the top for you. That you want to do these things for you. This selfish ambition. Some people can mask that selfish ambition very well. The Antichrist. He's going to be doing miracles. And the false prophet, they're going to be doing all kinds of miracles and wooing people's eyes. But inside, they are wicked to the core. It's Satan himself. But here's the thing. Is that being a servant, caring for other people. Jesus isn't saying throw off ambition. He's saying make your ambition about other people. Use that ambition and serve people. Don't serve yourself. Because remember what he said prior. That if you seek to save your life. If you're seeking all about me, myself, and I, poof, one day, guys, that's gone. Gone. Then what are you left with? Nothing. If you seek to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. You know, Jesus is actually challenging us here in what he says. You know what he challenges you with? He challenges you to become last. That's not a popular message, is it? We want to be great. What do you mean? We want to be the winner team, the winning team. Be last. Be the servant of all. Right? That's Jesus' kingdom. Jesus is challenging us to be last. To me, that just uh, boggles me. Because in the Christian's life, there should be no place for 
wanting accolades, for wanting glory. All that's surrendered. All that's, we've denied ourselves and picked up our cross and followed Him. We found true life in Him. And so Jesus says, if you want to be the greatest, be the servant of all, be last. Put other people before you. Ooh, wait a minute. I was just at Magic Mountain the other day, and nobody's raising their hand going, could I be last in that three-hour line? I want to be last. No, people are like trying to manufacture these fake bracelets to, you know, coming up in wheelchairs and all kinds of stuff. Why? Because they want to be at the front of the line. We want to be at the front of the line, and Jesus challenges us, and, and notice that it's a choice, guys. Jesus isn't saying we should all be slothful here and lazy and, you know, I'm not going to have any ambition. I'm just going to lay here and wait for God to return. That's not what it's speaking of here. It's speaking of being last by choosing to be last. Having that opportunity of a lifetime to be promoted within your company and you really want to do this, but yet it's going to take away time from you and your wife and your family. I have all the potential and all the ability to achieve that and to succeed and to be number one, but I choose, I choose to be last. I choose to do the right thing. Jesus is going to take a little kid on his lap to illustrate this imp importance. He says, if you want to be the greatest, be like this child. Let me remind you quickly that in these days, children were the least of the least. Sadly, they were less than a slave. Why? Because a child, and I kind of think this is funny in a weird way, a child is a dependent. I have to, they're not going to produce anything for me. Right? That's sadly how they looked at it because they were agrarian. And so if you had a lot of kids, well, you had a lot of free help, a lot of free workers. So kids were actually kind of looked down upon. And so Jesus, in illustrating this point about the first being last and the last being first, he takes this child on his lap and he says, you need to be like this child. Dependent, but also it's a picture of being the least. Be like this one choose right it's not a forceful thing how do we show god we love him we choose him he already chose us but in choosing him we see that he chose us but we all have that opportunity to pick up our cross deny ourselves pick up our cross and follow him and remember what he says also this is where we'll close did i say that five times already <laughs> mark chapter 8 verse 35 for whoever, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses it for my sake and the gospel will save it. That's it. And so Jesus here in giving this little example, guys, here's something you need to remember too. That if you're thinking you want to be the greatest and this and that and you have the greatest ministry, remember who the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is. It's Jesus. Jesus is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so what example did he give us to be the greatest? Whew. Jesus was the servant of all. Jesus was the servant of all. Let's pray. Father God, we just uh, thank you. We thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Jesus, I just, I pray that you would forgive us, God. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Forgive us of our trespasses, Lord, those things that are willful. And Father, I know that there were some things spoken here today that stirred our hearts. And I pray that we would all receive the stirring and that it would draw us closer to you, Father, not farther away. And Father, I thank you just for these pictures and for these examples. And we see a lot of what's going on now in your word. And so help us, God, to remain on your side, Father, and to stand with you, Jesus. And Lord, to be anxious, be in prayer over, over all things, but to be anxiously awaiting, busy about your business, loving people, God, serving people, not self-serving because one day that's all that's going to matter. 
All the other stuff is wood, hay, and stubble. It's all going to be burned away, but what will remain? The gold and the silver, the precious metals, those things that were done for you and not done for you with the intention of being (laughs) the greatest, but with the intention of doing it out of gratitude because of the grace that you've shown us, the gift that you have given us. This is what compels us. The love that you have shown us, a rotten sinner like me, the grace that you have shown me, it's this love that now compels me to love you and to give of myself to you. So Lord, help us. Help us through these trials and these tribulations. A, to not become afraid. B, to keep our eyes fixed on you. And C, to be purified, Lord. Clear out all that stuff that doesn't need to be there. And may we be on fire for you, Jesus. And again, we pray for our country, Lord. Pray for our president and the leadership, military, Israel, Lord, Christians abroad. Lord, give us all the peace that surpasses all understanding. And go with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.